a topic that is not very frequent to hear about in these corridors, so looking forward to his talk. Giovanni studied in Rome, then he did his PhD in uh, Boston University, went on to do a, a couple of postdocs in uh, MIT, Oxford, and then CERN in Geneva, and finally he got his position in Rome, back. And, um, well, one thing I want to share that he told us yesterday is that he teaches a level 4000 course in quantum gravity, something that here would be extremely popular, and probably is also extremely popular in, in Rome. And the bad news is that his lecture notes are not yet available. Uh, <laughs> so uh, we cannot ask him, maybe there, but in Italian, no? I don't know if... Uh, anyway, so he... Uh, and in this course, what he does, also I think it inter interesting, is that the first 10 hours of lecture are devoted to setting the problem. And so if you have a problem explaining to your friends why quantum theory and gravity are problematic to put together, uh, I have this problem, honestly, some of my students ask me, well, apparently it takes 10 hours to him to explain, uh, so it's okay uh, if you cannot explain in one line why there is a problem there. I don't know if we are going to get some answers today or to that question or to others during one hour's lecture, but let's start. Thank you. Thank you, Valerio. And <laughs> really, I thank the whole center. Everything works so nicely here. Everybody is so kind. Uh, you're welcome to come to Roma, but don't expect things to work <laughs> the same way, uh, although the science is also very good. But it, it finds its way to be good, but uh, not working so smoothly. So I start with, uh, since uh, Valeria told me here there are students curious about quantum gravity, but not knowing what it is, uh, in, uh, in, um, I will not take the 10 hours to introduce the problem, but I, I will use a kind of a joke that came to mind when uh, the characteristic of my work in quantum gravity is that uh, basically, before some of my papers, the quantum gravity problem was seen as a formal problem to be solved by mathematics, uh, some kind of uh, new brand of science, horrible brand of science, was uh, taking shape in which we would know if a quantum gravity theory is right or not because of its beauty. You know? And uh, I'm, I'm glad you are all surprised to hear this because it means that this uh, disastrous idea has uh, gradually disappeared, but this was how, when I was a PhD student, quantum gravity was viewed as something that would not have an experimental counterpart, but we would have this theory of everything obviously right, obviously right. I leave to you to give a definition because I don't have it. For that, I don't need 10 hours. I, uh, to give you the definition of obviously right, there is not enough time. Um, and so, and then, then my contribution has been primarily the one of trying to bring as much as possible with due um, um, attention and peculiarities quantum gravity research to be just research in physics, like everybody, every, every other branch of physics where you build models, some more crude, some more ambitious, but ultimately what you're striving for is confrontation with experimental data and uh, falsification of models or result, you know, results, experimental results in agreement with models. Um, this uh, was a dream uh, 15, 16 years ago is now in some sense a reality. I mean, there is at least a large research effort that follows this attitude. And uh, already a few years ago, uh, when this uh, research program started to branch out around the world, uh, Nature asked me to write a short review for them on how things were going, and I was looking for a title. And, uh, and uh, to make it clear that it's working but it's not easy, I made the joke, there is the word Planck, which is very important in our field, because of Max Planck and the fact that he gave the name to this special length scale, which appears to play a role in the problem. And there is, uh, Planck is also this thing, and there is an idiomatic expression in English which refers to when pirates uh, made this game with prisoners, walking Planck. And so 
there is some role for this uh, uh, working the plank feeling when you're doing research in quantum gravity, but you progress. So that was the title of a very short review, but something that took a lot of my time for a couple of years was preparing, that was already very important. At some point, leaving reviews in relativity, as you know, is a rather uh, serious journal uh, in the sense that uh, a, a field to be covered in leaving reviews in relativity needs to be established to a certain level. And um, at some point, they found appropriate to have a review of quantum gravity phenomenology. I worked on it rather, <laughs> rather with rather big effort. The fact that it's a living review is that I will have to update it every few years. And this will be particularly useful for this field. But right now, you find online still the uh, first version which I produced a uh, few years ago. And I'm in the process of producing an updated version. And if from things you read or you know, you have suggestions for material to add to my review, that would be um, uh, very valuable for, for my work on this. Uh, but mostly I mentioned this review today because uh, one option was to just give you one slide each, all of the uh, attempts that are being made now following this attitude toward the quantum gravity problem that I described in my opening remarks. But that would have been basically contentless. I would say for this model, without explaining, there is this opportunity experimentally that people are pursuing, it would have been a list of contentless remarks. So if you want that, you go to my review, which is basically that. It's, it's 100 pages, but most pages are just, uh, you know, bug, brief description of a model and brief description of an experimental opportunity. And instead, I chose to go into some detail also so that you get a feeling for how it works, this idea of doing phenomenology for quantum gravity, for one of the areas that compose this spectrum that we have now of efforts along the line. So you get the flavor of how it works. Uh, this is anyway the, the, the collected within this umbrella of things I will tell you today are some of the results that started this field. Some of the first things, the first, op, the first goal, the first thing that had to be established it was that there would be some measurements doable in the foreseeable future which would have the sensitivity to Planck length <laughs> effects. Yeah, this was what until early 1990s, if you pick up any review of quantum gravity from the early 1990s, you will see that it's all formulas, but at the beginning everybody had three lines saying, oh, the effects will be suppressed by the Planck length, terribly small, they can never be tested. So we will look for the theory of everything. Okay, this was the three lines okay, that I fought against, basically. And I can't say I won because, well, I I partial result, falsification. We have falsification of models. In these 15 years, we got to the point, and I will get there, even through this example, of falsifying pictures, some pictures, some candidate pictures with effects introduced genuinely at the Planck length, they are false. So this is the <coughs> best thing that can happen, well, second best thing that can happen in science. They are false. We know so some facts. We know some facts without beauty or lack of beauty. We know that some models, maybe they are beautiful, they're false. Okay? And this was a victory for this approach. But of course, this is like victory of a battle. Victory of the war will be if I can ever come back here. I will come back. <laughs> I will go everywhere if that happens. <laughs> uh, the first discovery of an effect due to Planck scale physics. That will be victory of the war. Uh, right now, still, if you want to decide, I hope you don't want to decide, because if you are in this room, you want nature to decide. You are not really in the mood of choosing between theories based on what you like or you don't like. But if you want to choose a theory right now, there are some you cannot choose because they are false. But many others are not false. And if you want to decide now which is your favorite quantum gravity, you will choose by taste, by beauty. But I ask you not to do this exercise. 
if you are in this building, if you work in this building, if you are in this room, you probably don't want to do this exercise. You just want to know what nature does, not what you like best among what mathematicians are developing. And that we don't know yet. If we lever, we cannot be sure we'll get to the point. Now, the set of ideas that, uh, that led uh, to the first results of, uh, of tests that could uh, reach the sensitivity of Planck scale effects, which is a tremendous sensitivity, I will show you which sense in a few slides, are of course for some of the most virulent, some of the most uh, novel features that possibly uh, a quantum gravity theory could accommodate. Uh, it's obvious for a phenomenology that you first rule out you know, the strongest, the most optimistic expectation about the nature and the strength of the effect and the maturity of a phenomenological problem, program, of course, is measured by slowly, slowly in time, or possibly fast in time, but gradually in time anyway, reaching sensitivities suitable for ruling out more subtle models. Okay. So the first group of ideas, which actually what changed, and I will come to that, what changed in these last few years, is that we also now know that this set of ideas is not so speculative. And I will come to one of the main reasons why we, we now know that, and we didn't know 15 years ago, is a set of ideas where you find that the Planck scale enters into Planck scale enters into a deformation of the on-shell relation. Um, I will motivate it more or less in a few ways, but the key let me go ah, yeah. so the key of course these results are obtained in some mathematical models, but the key way intuitively to understand how such features may come about is that the way you end up describing space-time in these theories is popular, this type of drawings with the, this would be space-time by an artist, artist rendition of course, okay? So not, not a Riemannian geometry, not something uh, if it was a table would be an absolutely flat table, okay? Riemannian geometry locally is always Minkowski. You know, at every point it feels like Minkowski. This means at every point is a perfect billiard, perfectly sharp. Okay? And instead this picture with bubbles that goes back to Wheeler in the 1960s, uh, space-time foam was the uh, captivating name he coined for this. This is what we imagine and this is what our formalisms in one way or another and the ways are very different but qualitatively produce inevitably is a picture of space-time which is not a Riemannian geometry, some new type of geometry where points are not sharp. Okay. For example, in quantum mechanics, you have phase spaces not sharp, but points are still sharp. If you want to localize something, you may have to sacrifice, for example, information on the velocity or the momentum of the particle, but you can still localize sharply a particle at a point at a certain time. In these geometries, you can't. And uh, propagation of particles in these geometries very, very vaguely may resemble propagation of light in certain materials. Okay. There are some analogies to a certain extent that can be found at the formal level. And this is why uh, in, in quite a bunch of models you end up having corrections to the on-shellness relation a bit like you have for propagation of light in certain materials. So you can look for effect like uh, light dispersion, like in materials. And this was the first wave of papers uh, toward the end of the 1990s. Uh, what uh, was later realized, and this is on the theory side my most significant contribution. Besides being a phenomenologist, I sometimes try to play quantum gravity theorist, and this is probably my best known result on the theory side. An important difference with respect to materials, light propagation in materials, I gave you this intuition, but it's, it's actually rather incorrect in a, in a sense that for a relativist is very important. 
propagation of light in a material, in whatever formalism you choose to describe it, will be always a formalism with a preferred frame. The material frame becomes preferred for the description of the propagation. In fact, the laws are not invariant. The laws of propagation of light in a material, they are not invariant. They are invariant if you map from Alice to Bob both light and the material. They are covariant, not invariant. But if you keep the material fixed, of course, you have a preferred frame of description, which is the material. What I realized in some papers toward the end of, uh, of 2000, early 2001, is that in, in some of these models that provide the motivation for this type of phenomenology, there were similar features, but there was no preferred frame. Okay, so it's a, it's, a, it's a new relativity rather than uh, abandoning relativity with respect to what was the initial assumption was in a pretty large literature which I uh, symbolized to these few papers. The assumption was, oh, but if we are finding, is it was a bit the situation of uh, end of the uh, 19th century. Uh, they were, they had the Maxwell equation, okay, with some law was really a dispersion relation, the law for light. In modern language, the Maxwell equation have a dispersion relation for light, which is not Galilean, it's not Galilean relativistic, was not compatible with the relativistic theory of that time, which is the Galilean one. And the first reaction was, oh, this must be preferred frame. This Maxwell theory must be finding a preferred frame in modern language, in ancient language that is ether. They looked for a preferred frame. There was no preferred frame in the data. Of course, in the data, there can never be no preferred frame. In the data, there is no preferred frame to a certain level of precision of the measurements. But what was then achieved is to understand the Maxwell equation actually did not require a preferred frame. The onshellness was deformed with respect to the Galilean one. The, the onshellness for photons is inadmissible in Galilean relativity. But the Maxwell theory was invariant under a suitably deformed relativistic theory. The relativistic theory of Einstein is, in technical in very precise technical mathematical sense, a dimensionful deformation of the Galilean theory of Galilei. Okay. So, and we, we had this transition, really, in these few years from interpreting the theories that were giving these results as preferred frame theories to then understanding that they were instead not theories with the preferred frame, but theory with the deformed relativity. Yet another deformation of relativistic laws, the first deformation was by a velocity scale, as you know. Now we, some of, some of these theories are confronting us with a deformation by a length scale, the Planck length. Uh, this, uh, this is very recent uh, results. Well, not 1938, <laughs> but no, 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 no. <laughs> it was not intended as a joke. The best jokes are the ones you don't want to make. <laughs> I was going to say that this is something we understood recently, and maybe for a colloquium presentation is, uh, is not yet well digested, but what we understood recently is one next layer which is uh, st maybe striking for those outside quantum gravity, surely very striking. What we understood recently is that all, all this bunch of results, these kind of features that were here, the relativistic issues, the modification of shellness, they could all very elegantly, compactly, I will show one slide later that just shows you the power of this concept, organized by thinking that momentum space is curved. Momentum space is curved, and we started to write, I, uh, yes, uh, since it was a development of that relativistic idea, I was among the authors of the first paper on, in the modern era on curved momentum space as a powerfully organizing notion for all these results. And then somebody brought to our attention a paper from 1938, my Bach's born, and was probably the second or third paper in quantum gravity written in the history of physics. This is starting to be the oldest problem in, in physics, in the history of physics, you know. Strong interactions, which are usually described as a stubborn problem, strong interactions were not known when, the first, when we first started to, not we, I'm a little younger, but uh, when the problem of quantum gravity started to be studied, 
Strong interactions were not even known that existed. In particle physics, they are considered like a stubborn one, you know, a story of sorry, very stubborn problem. But the, they were not known, and they were first experimental evidence, modeling. Now we have a theory, which is pretty good, works very well. We need to understand a little bit confinement, but I mean, we have a good theory of strong interaction. For quantum gravity, we are still pretty much rediscovering or, or making small improvements on the starting point. So this is clearly a particularly challenging uh, effort in the history of physics. <coughs> uh, at least its duration starts to point to that and various things. But it's amusing to notice that in those early days where we're looking at the quantum gravity problem from a more conceptual perspective, not very technical, uh, beautiful paper by uh, Bronstein, a Russian scientist who, who could have given a lot to this research, ended up uh, in the hands of Stalin uh, very young and stopped uh, publishing and stopped doing everything else. But um, some of these papers are very beautiful to read. Uh, and uh, Max Born made a simple observation. Well, he was, of course, biased toward Born reciprocity said, I don't understand how you could do quantum gravity if you have momentum space flat. Uh, Born reciprocity, which is basically this possibility to interchange P and X in quantum, in quantum mechanical formulation, such a strong ingredient of quantum mechanics, how can I then adapt quantum mechanics to a theory which has curved space time and flat momentum space? You know, there is the tangent bundle, cotangent bundle construction. The, Momentum space is really a space of planes, flat spaces tangent to the curved space time. So in the standard construction, it's inevitable that momentum space is flat, because it's a tangent space. Really. And, uh, and Max Born, pro in his view, this was the toughest issue for quantum gravity. And we, some theories which were produced not with that intent we are understanding that they do have curved momentum space. They were constructed to address aspects of the quantum gravity problem, and they do this. The most significant example, and this goes, uh, the, the relatively recent results, I have here a paper that was very important in this understanding. Something which is very important for the last decade is that we finally can solve two plus one dimensional quantum gravity. 2 plus 1 dimensional quantum gravity is much simpler than the problem we are interested in. Because gravity, Einstein-Hilbert theory, in 2 plus 1 dimension, there is no uh, propagating degrees of freedom. It's a topological theory. Its solutions are, are uh, in some sense, at the classical level, is a nearly trivial theory, 2 plus 1 dimensional gravity. Quantizity is hard because of the conceptual challenges of applying quantum mechanics to a theory which, anyway, is geometrical for the space-time side. It took a long time. This was a hot subject for nearly 30 years, the study of 2 plus 1 dimensional gravity. And the result, however, now that is a rather well understood theory, is that it is a theory with the features that I described at the beginning. In particular, momentum space is very evidently curved. This is a, a very simple calculation in 2 plus 1 gravity to show you can actually integrate out you can, you can couple gravity to matter, and you can fully now integrate out gravity. And see what, the, so you can just describe exactly, non-perturbatively, non, uh, non the implications of gravity on matter, and the momenta of matter live on a curved momentum space. Okay, this is a, a rigorous result at this point. And the onshellness is deformed, roughly in the type of formula, well, certainly, because that is a, is a Taylor expansion, so surely in the formula that I described at the beginning. And, uh, and it is a theory which is relativistic. Okay. So the features that I described in the beginning may well not be properties of 3 plus 1 gravity, because 3 plus 1 gravity is a But at least now we know that they are properties of one quantum gravity, which is the simpler uh, daughter theory of two plus one dimensions. So this provided further encouragement for this research. Uh, I will not give you, well, this if you have questions, but this is 
um, the formalism that we developed to handle in full generality even in more than two plus one dimensions uh, curvature of momentum space. I just want to show you this slide without comment. This is, well, no, no, but there's a good reason not to comment it because you just have to weigh formulas. This is how we characterized a certain algebra of properties of certain non-commutative space-time, certain formalisms of, uh, of interest in quantum gravity research. You needed to give full definition of these formalisms, at the very least, these formulas. This was the core, what we thought would be the core structure. Once we realized that this theory had a current momentum space, we now describe all this by, right, by saying that this is a theory with a De Sitter metric on momentum space. This is De Sitter in commoving coordinates. And with a certain affine connection, which is this one, on momentum space. That's all. Just to give you a sense of how powerful this recent underscanning has been. Uh, as a, maybe my last effort of making you comfortable with this idea of a new relativistic theory, let me remind you, well, or maybe show you, because if you haven't done too much relativistic work, you might not even know our textbooks, and I find that this is not okay, our textbooks about one, the most beautiful feature of, of special relativity. This is a dimensionful deformation of Galilean relativity governed by a velocity scale. And this wonderful deformation is such that you can combine any two vector velocities and they combine in such a way that the resulting vector has modulus smaller than one in C units. Okay. It's a beautiful geometrical property. And uh, in textbooks, I bet in your textbooks of special relativity, all you are told about this wonderful thing nature tried to do is this. For parallel velocities, you have this nonlinear, oh, nonlinear, oh, okay. What nature chose to do was not just nonlinear. If you combine two generic velocities, non-parallel, this is how they combine, okay? And this is a easy but tedious calculation. You just combine basically two boosts. The combination, the composition law for non-parallel velocities is of course non-linear, but it's also non-commutative and non-associative. Okay. It's basically the worst, in quotes, the worst type of sum law that mathematicians make sense of. Nature chose this. This is in our experimental data. This is Thomas Wigner rotations is in here. This formula is all of special relativity. In here, there is Thomas Wigner rotation. There is everything. There is the fact that from two boosts, you get the rotation, which is what the main relativistic difference between Galilean and Einsteinian relativity. In Galilean relativity, two boosts don't give you rotation. They give you another boost. They basically commute. Uh, the, the, the tricky part that is needed to have C as an invariant is that it will commute. I always like in my seminars, especially with young people present, to show this formula because some other colloquium soon, I predict, will be given by somebody who will talk to you about beauty. <laughs> and now, no, I have to do this. Yeah. Now it's a bit easier, but when I was the age of some of the guys in this audience, I was having a hard time with these guys of beauty. And they will come here and give a nice colloquium, much better than mine, more polished, more elegant. Of course, they know beauty. But, and they will tell you that uh, we don't need experiments. We will know what is the right theory by beauty. So you, please, get this. And when they show you their beauty, you tell them, look, we had Galilean composition law, where V plus V plus W was V plus W. And nature does this. Can you tell me how I could guess this by beauty? Okay. Of course, this is, the guy will tell you, this is beautiful. Of course, it's beautiful. This is incredibly beautiful. But it's beautiful afterwards. 
you know. And they are selling you beauty before. They are telling you that with beauty you guess this. No, beauty, nature tells us what is beautiful. You and I don't know what is beautiful. The guy that tells you about beauty doesn't know what is beautiful. Nature knows what is beautiful, shows you this, and if I, I promise if you spend 10 hours with this law, you will like it better than your girlfriend or boyfriend. <laughs> but you have to spend 10 hours with it. And you must be a physicist, a little bit of a nerd. <laughs> and, and, and nature told you, not your sense of beauty. Okay. When nature tells you and you spend 10 hours with it, you say, oh, wow. This is really wow. Okay? But keep it on the side for when the next colloquium is about beauty. For my colloquium, it's time to move more toward the phenomenology side. I, I needed, I thought it's always healthy to give you a minimum of motivation for uh, the tests, but the tests are really my, my juice, I say, the, 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 the objective. Uh, this is more on the formalism and, and the curved momentum space, and this is maybe not suitable for this presentation. Uh, for quantum gravity, those who have worked on this phenomenology earlier, there is something else similar to what I showed you uh, about those many formulas that collapse to simple properties of curved momentum space. Also, calculations become incredibly simpler when you realize that there is behind the curved momentum space. For example, I will soon tell you that one of the things we can measure very well is if as assumed in some of the formulas at the beginning, there is a tiny difference in the velocity of photons of different energy. Okay? A Planck scale suppressed, so very, very tiny. Uh, we have a, a very good ability to study this possibility, which in some models is present. Now, to compute exactly how what, how much is this difference? How much the velocity depends on energy was a kind of a challenging effort up to just five or six years ago. Now we understand that we can do this calculation. The calculation is redshift, funny enough. So the time delays that I will show you the phenomenology for in a few minutes really are redshift on momentum space. So in the same sense in which, and it's technically the same calculation, in the same sense in which a curved space-time produces redshift, which is actually a class of misleading inferences from the point of view of relativist. Redshift, in the point of view of relativist, is a class of misleading inferences in the sense that you, you have, if you have massless particle emitted with the same energy but at different time, they reach you with different energy, different color. Same color particle, when ordinary redshift, the most dramatic way, it's usually not this one that is shown, but this is the most dramatic way. If you have, from a certain source, same energy particle emitted at a different time, they reach you, same color particle, they reach you with different color. Because they travel longer into the expanding space time, and the redshift is bigger, so they reach you with different color. So you make a misleading inference about what was the color at the source. If you didn't know general relativity, you would guess one reached me red, the other one blue. The guy on that other planet is sending me some red and some blue. Instead, he's sending all blue, okay? But some earlier and some later, and the one he sends later reach you rather reddish, okay? Now, these time delays that we will see, we now understand in a, in a simple way, is just the dual effect to this. So if you have curved momentum space, it produces, of course, on space-time, not on momentum space, it's always dual space that feels redshift. It produces misleading asperities about the emission times. Okay. So really, particles that are simultaneously emitted reach you at different time. So you would infer the way that they were emitted at different time. Maybe this was a bit too uh, specialist uh, remark, but it's so powerful that I thought I should mention. 
But let me now switch completely. This is LT in this field. Let me switch over here. Some theorist, good or bad, gave me such a formula. This formula. This is the travel time. This uh, symbolically just tells you for a certain travel time, T, the arrival time of two particles of different energy with difference of energy given by E differ in spite of them being massless or of, of mass negligible with respect to the other scales in the game. The time of times, the arrival times simultaneously emitted, the arrival times differ by a little bit. They differ by proportional to the travel time, but by suppressed by the ratio of the energy of the particle versus the Planck scale. Okay? So this is now when we when when we put on the head of phenomenologists. Okay? Some theories gives us this. Can we falsify? Now this is the phenomenology. Okay? The theories must motivate the phenomenologist. This was the first half of the presentation. Now, some theorists has proposed this. Now, can we falsify it? Well, don't read the bottom for the moment, but think about it. Well, it's not very easy. Especially on Earth, it's basically impossible. Okay? On Earth, uh, we never have travel times long enough. You see, you need this product to become a time you can measure. The delta t must be an appreciable time, maybe a nanosecond. Okay? But for the type of particles whose time of travel we can measure sharply, they have energy which in Planck scale units is maybe 10 to minus 20, 10 to minus 18, 10 to minus 22. The travel times are terrestrial travel times, fractions of seconds typically. And so this is totally negligible. As, as, as fully consistent with what the reviews in the beginning of the 1990s and before, but up to the beginning of the 1990s, this was the type of, without going specifically to this formula, the type of general claim. Any formula of quantum gravity of at low energy will have a suppression by ratio of energy to the Planck scale. This is easy to guess. And this suppression is huge. For the most energetic particles that we can produce at the LHC, this is still a ratio of about 10 to minus 16. Okay. So, tremendous suppression. This n could be 1, could be 2. This is a, we are in a Taylor expansion. If it's 2, it's total disaster, but even 1. Okay. So this was the three lines that I mentioned that you can inevitably find in all these reviews up to the mid-1990s. Where they were basically just commenting on this ratio, which indeed is always present. Uh, what changed for us in this particular line of research that I'm focusing on, what changed things for us was that in 1997, it was established the gamma ray bursts, and for, if, if you don't know, I will say briefly what they are in a second. But in 1997, these bursts, these are, these are phenomenal explosions. And if you ask me, there is a strange story. They were discovered, they were first discovered by the programs monitoring Russia and the US were monitoring each other for atomic bomb experiments. And this, it was discovered, uh, gamma ray bursts were discovered in this way. At first, it was thought they would be bombs, but it was later understood that they are natural phenomena since they are so intense, the expectation initially would be that they would be local. Well, the expectation initially was that they would be in Russia. But then, <laughs> <laughs> gradually, our galaxy. And in 1997, it became obvious from the data, because we managed to measure, actually, not for nationalism, but it was an Italian collaboration, Beppo Sachs, that contributed decisively to this result by measuring an optical counterpart to a gamma ray burst, that these gamma ray bursts instead are typically are cosmo at cosmological distances. We now have, uh, we, we measure distances of several gamma ray bursts. The redshift is typically between one and three, with some gamma ray bursts a redshift of eight, nine, so they're far away stuff. Why was that important? 
Well, these explosions are really, which we don't understand, by the way. I mean, astrophysicists have good models. <coughs> are there any other astrophysicists pro present? <laughs> but you're filming. <laughs> <laughs> No, oh, but I know I love them. Without astrophysicists, I couldn't do my job, so I love them. I can't take a joke with them. They have good models of gamma ray bursts until the next measurement of gamma ray burst. <laughs> but then they have another good model, so the situation <laughs> is stable. Uh, but they're really incredible objects. In, in some, some of these bursts, they produce more light than the rest of the universe for us in the very short time that they exist. Okay? The main, the main, the, this is important for my point. The main event of a gamma ray burst can be as short as a fraction of a second, typically only one or two seconds. And it's a huge explosion. And... Uh, we capture many photons up to energies of a GV, of several GV, of hundreds, in some cases a few tens of GV, from distances of, which I mentioned, redshifts of one, two, three, four. Why is this relevant? Because now, if this T is the time of travel from a redshift of uh, four, and this energy is a few GVs. And this is still the Planck scale. So it's still 10 to 19 GVs. The delta T, if you work out the numbers, the delta T is of order the second. So it's comparable. Both is, is very, it, it was of course within our timing capability. That's obvious. But what is important is comparable to the overall duration of the main event of the gamma ray burst. There, the limiting factor is not so much our clocks, of course, a second is easy game for our clocks. But it's important, uh, clocks are sharp, but the event is not sharp. And it's quite relevant that our astrophysical models, I was joking before, we have a reasonably good understanding of this gamma ray burst, but not good enough to give us the time history. So we cannot say this photon was emitted uh, at this time. We can only say, well, roughly speaking, there was a bunch of photons emitted within a two, three second window. So if the effect was uh, at a microsecond, it, it would be intangible for sure. Actually, at a millisecond or a few milliseconds with statistical analysis could have been uh, maybe uh, extracted uh, over a sufficiently large sample especially considering some gamma ray bursts have duration smaller than a second, those are the short bursts. But anyway, what we figured out in these early papers, this early paper is that uh, you, once you realize that gamma ray bursts are cosmological, so they are cosmological distances, this formula could be tested. Okay. Now, not really that formula. This is a problem for the phenomenology, but it has to be like this. That formula, the formalism are very complicated. I can easily compute this. Now I can do it really easy, this formula. If you give me a certain curved momentum space, you give me a certain theory, I extract what is the curved momentum space, I can easily infer what is the delay, compute what is the delay from the curved momentum space if space-time is flat. What we really are at the point of in the literature is to do basically the same level of calculations that you know how to do with curved phase time and flat momentum space, we know how to do with curved momentum space and flat space time. But <laughs> if momentum space is curved and we need to analyze data over cosmological distances, we cannot be satisfied with flat space time description. Space-time expansion, space-time curvature is, uh, is well significant for observation of cosmological distances. So what we really would need now is to master a situation where both momentum space and space-time are both curved. And this is work in progress. Uh, several groups are, 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 are studying this issue and, and um, I don't know yet that uh, we have a, a, a definite candidate for it. So far, the phenomenology 
has been, so instead of the time of travel, which I could just write t, here I basically add t, instead of this integral over redshifts that I have here, because in flat space time, this integral over redshifts becomes just the time of travel. This is the corresponding quantity, and you need a cosmological model. Here I'm, I'm using the parameters of the, what is the standard cosmological model to do this calculation. And this integral is what replaces delta t uh, within a certain set of assumptions, which we are learning that they are correct in some models, not correct in some others. So mm, the theory must grow a little more in order to make full use of this sensitivity uh, that we have. But for the cases where this formula applies, uh, which we now start to understand which cases they are. There are cases where translation transformations are, have a certain property. Uh, we are really at Planck scale sensitivity. Uh, and this is how, now, I just, easy to explain one simple way to get these limits. A gamma ray burst is uh, you know, in our telescope is just a flux of photons, a suddenly very dense flux of photons that invest the telescope. This flux is very high and low energies, of course, okay? <clears throat> but I'm here showing to you just for one particular magnificent burst. This is a burst which was observed in May of 2009, okay? Uh, just less than a year, a few months after we turned on, others know what to do, we turned on the Fermi telescope, which is right now the best telescope for this type of studies. Just a few months after it was turned on, it saw this fantastic short burst. As you can see, I'm only showing you in this plot, these are photons of the gamma ray burst, of a certain energy observed at a certain time on the clock of the telescope, okay? And only the most energetic ones. The minimum energy here is 1 GeV. Below 1 GeV, there are very many, 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 very many more. For the type of study I'm doing, for obvious reasons, since the energy is in the numerator, <coughs> the highest part of the signal, highest energy part of the signal is relevant. And you see that the main, uh, this was a short burst, the main part of the emission is really condensated in about a third of a second here. Okay, then it, you know, trickles for a little longer, but the main emission is only in a window of uh, something like a third of a second. And it's quite remarkable that the highest energy photon, much more energetic than any other in the collection, 31 GV, was detected within this time window. What can we infer from this? It's not easy. I mean, it's uh, not obvious. Let's see. If they were emitted or see, or if, if this, uh, most simplest interpretation, this photon was emitted in the time window where this bunch of photons was emitted, evidently was the most intense phase of the gamma ray burst. It was emitted in that time window and it reached us in that time window. Okay? Within this assumption, which we shall question in a second because we have to do this right, but within this assumption, the fact that this reaches us within that time window allows us evidently to set a limit on how big the quantum space-time effect I discussed earlier could be. Clearly that effect, this was a burst at the redshift of 0.9, okay? Over a distance of 0.9 in redshift, this effect of time arrival difference did not accumulate enough to let this fall off of this window. So we have a bound on this effect. Questions? This, this needs to be clear because I have to convince you that these measurements can be done.
Is this clear? Good. OK, so I have a limit on, on, the, on, the, on the plant scale effect. And if you work out numbers, this limit is, is just around the plant scale. Okay. So just the thing I dreamed in the middle of the 1990s, uh, just about 20 years later, 15 years later, let's say, uh, was there. Of course, really, we are not exactly there. Okay? Because with only one burst, the initial assumption, if you want to be a scientist, uh, you have to be careful, is a rather robust assumption. But there is an alternative, for example. It could be that just we were unlucky. This photon was emitted, let's say, uh, a bit after these guys here. But then there was just a compensating effect over the travel time, and it arrived in this window. You see what I'm trying to say? Okay. This is conspiracy. Very unlikely. Very unlikely. Okay. But you would like to rule it out. Can we rule it out? It's, it's a, I think it's not something we urgently want to rule out, because you see, it's rather contrived as a possibility. If we should be just unlucky. That the, the distance of this gamma ray burst just happened to be right. And the energy scale were just right that what we see as a near simultaneous detection is really the result of two effects that compensated each other. Okay? So it's not really so probable. But anyway, it's important for me that we can, in principle, be reassured that this does not occur. Because unfortunately, so far, we, are, we have only this one. It's very unlucky situation. Fermi was turned on after a few months, caught this burst. It's still working now. It's been working for another seven years. No other burst like this has been seen, which is something I always try. Whenever I stumble with, you know, I cross paths with somebody from Fermi, I always try to complain about <laughs> them. <laughs> they say I have to complain to gamma ray burst, but I complain to them. I don't know. Maybe they, they, I complain to them, and they complain to gamma ray burst. But it was so lucky that after a few months, they caught this one. And after that, another seven years, nothing. But imagine, as I was hoping, when this one came out after a few months, you may imagine, as a formal theorist, they always excuse me when I make these criticism. I'm a formal theorist and think Poisson statistics is more complicated than you imagine, and blah, blah, blah. I was assuming that by now I would have about 15 of these. Gamma ray bursts uh, have not collaborated, uh, from what uh, Fermi people tell me. And I have only one. With only one, some of you may say, oh, wait a second. You are trying to convince us of plant scale sensitivity, but it's subject to further scrutiny. Yes, but if I had 15 from different redshift, these gamma ray bursts, I told you, they have broad range of redshifts, from even 0.5 to 5, 6. If this compensation happens for this burst, OK, we were unlucky. But if we have 15 gamma ray bursts at different distances, evidently the effect I'm trying to study grows with distance. Okay? And the only compensating effect I can imagine is instead at the source. It should be that this energetic one was by accident emitted with just the right time delay. Well. For one gamma ray burst, I can still, I'm a scientist, I have to be prudent, I can still allow for the conspiracy option. But if for 50 gamma ray bursts at different redshift, it always happens something like this, I will claim that I have a limit. Okay. So this to close the case for the ability that this phenomenology has of falsifying effects, uh, I would say that this is already shown here. Uh, and in particular, I like to suggest that you imagine a situation where, which might not be too distant in the future, where we have 10 of these. Okay. Uh, this is not very important in the detail, just to give you a sense of the experimental effort that this research, which did not exist 15 years ago, now has produced. This is just some of the most quoted limits, you know, many attempts. I've described you the gamma ray burst, which has produced so far the best limit, although with this little caveat. Uh, 
but many things have been tried. Here, there are not only these are gamma ray bursts, but these are pulsars, uh, these are blazars, which is another type of astrophysical object, uh, various telescopes, various uh, collaborations. It's been a large effort. It's been real phenomenology. Okay? No, no beauty. Ugly. Very ugly. Wonderfully ugly. Uh, the closing part of my talk, a few opportunities which are connected to this line of research, but they take a new shape. First, what I'm most excited about is that astrophysics is changing dramatically. It's happening now, and it's not because of quantum gravity or whatever, it's happening because of our telescopes. It's very recent that we have tangible ability to see cosmological neutrinos. You must have heard, or some of you at least have heard, about the result of the Ice Cube Observatory, that although we, so far we don't have any neutrino that we can point back to a source, so astrophysics via neutrino is not yet really started in the sense of observing in neutrinos, but once again is a proof or concept. I mean, we have definite evidence that we are seeing cosmological neutrinos, neutrinos that come from faraway sources. Uh, inevitably, with due time, we will start astrophysics with neutrinos, meaning we will see sources in neutrinos, probably from one source, only one neutrino. But that's infinitely many more neutrinos that we have ever seen from a source, with the rare exception like supernova 1987a. And so, so it's, this will change, I promise, this will change completely astrophysics and so this is, of course, very important. Also, a little bit, this little field that I told you about, this will be very important because neutrinos have uh, quite a bit of uh, extra, and in fact, we already have a paper uh, by myself in collaboration with two distinguished astrophysics, uh, Dafte Guetta and Svi Piran, where we point strongly the attention of the community to what this, which is, of course, most importantly, a gigantic new thing for astrophysics, but also for this new field of quantum gravity phenomenology, this could be a fantastic new window. For example, if I was to catch a neutrino, these neutrinos that Ice Cube observes are in the energies of the hundreds, thousands of TVs. So energies in some cases million times, 10 to the 6 times bigger then the type of energies I was using in that gamma ray burst analysis with photon. And there are good reasons. The universe is actually, as far as we understand, is opaque to high energy photons. The background of soft photons, like the microwave background, the background of soft photons in the universe makes it so that uh, very hard, very high energy photons cannot reach our telescopes. Basically, they disappear into positron electron pairs along the way. Of course, for neutrino, this is not an issue. A neutrino go through the universe like butter, of course. And, and of course, there is no opacity to high energy neutrinos. If, you know, in the future, we will see neutrinos of even higher energies than we see with ice cube. So for this phenomenology, this creates an opportunity of a much better leverage on the effects. Because if instead of using GB photons, I can use, say, 1,000 TV, a million GB neutrinos, immediately I gain six order of magnitudes in sensitivity for this phenomenology, evidently. Okay. Uh, something else which is improving, and I know that there are new telescopes in preparation. Uh, now, all that I told you was about, uh, in, in fact, this why I don't remember why I had this. All that I told you, because is where most results and the most easy to discuss results are available, used as intuition this picture. Still the space time form picture of, of Wheeler. But they were not very fuzzy, you know. You should have noticed I'm motivated with this, but what I used was not fuzzy. I had delta t, for example, 
was the protagonist. A, a sharp observable, delta t. The reason is obvious, and you can see it in the uh, propagation of light in material story. When you have the environment as degrees of freedom, Minkowski you know, space-time is dead. You know, it's table. But when the environment, when, so when the environment is Minkowski space-time, there is no structure, and all you can have is structureless laws. The only structure of Minkowski space-time, of course, is the speed of light c. That's the only structure. For the rest is smooth table. When you have propagation in material, there is scales of the structure of the material, and besides producing other things, they end up providing a modification of the onshellness of the dispersion relation. So you have dispersive propagation. So this space-time form and some of the formalisms like space-time non-commutativity that I use to model it produce modification of the onshellness for both technical reasons, but, we, but, but also reasons we understand on the basis of the analogy that I suggested. But of course, even more primitively, I could say, even more fundamentally, if this picture is correct, if geometry is fuzzy, if the geometry of space-time is not Riemannian, it's not such that at every point you have sharp point and a possibility of describing with a flat Minkowski space-time at the point, but you have this bubbly structure, then the, the most generic prediction is fuzziness. So, no, for example, in the models where these time delays can be uh, derived, certain space-time non-commutativity models are the one where, uh, where this is uh, most uh, constructively, most rigorously derivable, not only you would have a certain, maybe very small, but a certain fact in which this high energy photon either tends to be typically earlier or typically later than the low energy one, but on top of it, you should inevitably be, have, if the space time is fuzzy, a certain fuzziness in this delta t. You, you, am I using language which is? So, in some sense, I have focused on the possibility that the space-time form changes the form of the light cone. Instead of being like two lines at 90 degrees, it becomes like bended lines. This is really a modified dispersion relation, looks like. But the most primitive thing is that the lines are no longer sharp, that they become fuzzy. The light cone becomes fuzzy. So what we really want to do is to look for both features, both the possibility that the cone is deformed and the possibility that the cone is fuzzy. Keeping in mind that in most of the models that we can analyze in some detail, both things are present. The light cone is deformed and fuzzy. Okay. But to study fuzziness is really the new frontier. Okay. So far what has been tried in, a, in an early paper, I just made for fuzziness the same point you saw me make today in a little more technical way. I just did kind of a back of the envelope sensitivity estimate showing that even for fuzziness with a certain different, this was for precision interferometry with large interferometers like Virgo, LIGO that you have heard uh, about because of the gravity wave observation. Uh, rather surprisingly, I could also argue that these things could reach sensitivity to certain classes of Planck scale effects for fuzziness. Okay. Uh, this had a short burst of interest in that respect, but then this became uh, the applications of this argument became in a different context, the context of astrophysics again. I had in mind the big kilometer-long interferometers, but uh, motivated by these early studies on fuzziness, uh, some research groups, I have here a couple of papers, but for example in my review you will see cited about 
20 papers, which again is a subset of the literature on this. Uh, for example, on the same level of intuition of this sensitivity estimate I made, you can motivate the idea that the image of a distant quasar, the distant quasars are some of the most distant sharp objects. They are like points, you know, to, to what a physicist can mean by a point. So they are rather sharp circles, basically, okay? Some of the most distant rather sharp points in the sky are quasars. And a prediction you would have from some quantum gravity arguments is that these points should look more sharp and lower if you, are, if you use a filter for light, you know, the, low, the longer wavelength light should look more sharp, the point, and the shorter wavelength should look more fuzzy. Again, because the effects inevitably have, there are different effects now and I don't get into that, but they inevitably have this initial suppression by energy over Planck scale. So, um, so there has been a, a, an effort uh, models are still very crude and I'm not sure that the data analysis is, is, is up to the standards of this other uh, uh, literature that I mentioned which is easier, the systematic effects is easier, but clearly there is a literature convincing enough in the point of view that we, uh, we have there some opportunity for Planck scale sensitivity also for study of fuzziness. Uh, recently with uh, with some uh, very expert astrophysicists, we observed that gamma ray bursts themselves in a different way can also be used for this fuzziness study. And uh, I'll stop here, I'm already slightly long. Uh, just to make a little joke uh, about the fact that, well, I'm not saying it's gonna be easy, of course, okay. I, I made a, I was laughing about, and I'm proud to laugh about uh, the we will know by beauty and we will have theory of everything, blah, 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 that was so fashionable 15 years ago. But the discovery, while falsifying models, I think is something, some, the weirdest models will be falsified, we now know. But the discovery of a quantum gravity effect, I cannot guarantee, even for infinite time. Uh, although for infinite time, <laughs> for, even for a century, I am optimistic, but even for, uh, the youngest members of the audience that in your career you will see the first one where the effects, I don't know. I'm not a, I'm not a magician. But, uh, uh, surely when working at this, you have the feeling, when you work in one reality problem, you have the feeling, nature is a feeling, of course, nature is not like that, but the feeling is like some big secret has been hidden from us very carefully. I mean, it's really tough. But this is the human feeling. Basically, my hope, especially for the youngest in the audience, is that you will get to know a first quantum gravity effect. Maybe nature was hiding very well in some areas, but like a little kid left the feet out <laughs> and we can catch it sooner than my pessimistic present expectations. Thank you very much. Thank you for this talk. I think we can take a couple of questions and then uh, Giovanni will be also here tomorrow afternoon uh, and this afternoon at some point so you can also discuss in private. Is there any question now? Okay, Just a very silly question. I mean that gamma ray, uh, that gamma ray burst you presented, um, you made the claim that this was, I don't know, four or eight at the redshift of four or eight. Uh, how, how do you know what the redshift of that thing is? Well, how, how, I mean, that no, this is a very fair question. Thank you. Well, this one in particular, I, I mentioned that we know for sure. Well, we know that uh, for sure in science is a little bit. We know we have good evidence that some gamma ray bursts are redshift of four, eight, and so on. This one in particular is, is was not very far. It's just the quality of the data was so good that is the best I can show you. Was at the redshift of 0.9. But it's a good question, to ask, but how do you know that you, you see it in one direction? How do you know how far it is? Well, the, the technique that is given now started in 97, as I mentioned. It's the, the way we understood they were cosmological in the first place. 
and this continue to give consistent results all around because you also have certain checks like the luminosity dependence on redshift, you know, everything. You have some theory expectations that by this tool of analysis work well, so everything is in a self-assuring picture. But basically the technique is that you point the telescope very quickly in the direction of the galaxy. This was a challenge until now it's not so much of a challenge to uh, so Fermi sees the gamma ray burst, big telescope, is not good at pointing sources. So the immediately the signal goes to telescopes that can point sources. They turn very quickly, or someone, some of them by luck is just there. And they see if in that direction, where Fermi at high energies sees a gamma ray burst, if there is a host galaxy. If there is a host galaxy in that direction, then you can study the redshift of light in that galaxy, really the redshift lines, and from that you measure the distance. So, so you assume that this, this uh, cosmic event happened in that galaxy? We just you mentioned. assume that it is in that galaxy which happens to be exactly in the direction where it comes from. Uh, there is a, a certain level of possible uh, mismatch in some cases, of course, but this is now a large correction of data. Certainly for one single gamma ray burst, I could also, probably I would take the point, I should be also more prudent on that. I could say, well, maybe the redshift, uh, maybe it happened to be that it was a galaxy just there. Maybe this is what you're... No, I, I, I just it could no be. Idea how you no, no, this is, how, this is how they do it. They look for a galaxy and they measure the redshift. You can, you can probably calculate the probability that the galaxy is there by chance, because this is the risk. The risk is that you point there, you find a galaxy, but that galaxy has nothing to do with that gamma ray burst. This would not happen typically, but one or once or twice uh, in a hundred gamma ray bursts it could happen. And I guess I cannot exclude myself, surely, but even the guys who do these analyses cannot exclude that one time they will just get a missed. Uh, so in some sense also for my analysis here, I could add that element of concern. But as usual, the key here is that we are hoping, imagining, it was very promising in 2009, now a little less than we'd be soon, to have a collection of these. And on a collection of these, all such concerns fade away. They can never be excluded by philosophers' standards, but by our standards, they fade away to the level of tolerability, including this one. Okay, if there is no, uh, oh, there is one, just one question, last question there. Very good. <laughs> uh, again, it's the same, uh, it's the same. I, I made the point about the, uh, the heaviness in the analysis of the assumption that this photon was emitted roughly simultaneously with these ones. Uh, there is another role in the analysis of another rather robust assumption, which is that the host galaxy really is the host galaxy, it's not a galaxy there. And there is a third, and probably we can find five or six, but all rather robust. But maybe together it would be nice to have a few bursts. But again, this, this photon is here. Okay? This photon arrived in Fermi just in that time window. Was it from the gamma ray burst? Because you cannot say, you just see a photon, maybe you have some information of the direction. Was it from the gamma ray burst? Because if this is not, you know, here, out of this, like this is nearly 15 or 16 of them, uh, maybe one or two happen to be there by chance, but the rest is from the burst. But unfortunately, the limit depends very strongly on this one. You lose an order of magnitude, really. Nearly an order of magnitude if you renounce to this one. So your question is very significant. Well, the Fermi collaboration dedicated to this photon and connecting to the gamma ray burst, two-thirds of the paper, <laughs> of course. Okay? And surprise, the end of the analysis was that it was 5.1 standard deviation uh, confidence. So it was of the gamma ray burst in our sense. Okay? But you can question, maybe if you did the analysis or I did the analysis, I would get only four standard deviation, maybe making it wrong, okay? But again, on this one burst, 
It depends strongly on this one photon. It depends crucially on the host galaxy. It depends crucially on, uh, however, uh, conspiracy-like uh, assumption about that. So this one single gamma ray burst, you would not probably want to make uh, a claim. I know the story of when the paper was published in Nature, the paper where Fermi put uh, a limit using this. Uh, somehow I knew part of the story about the refereeing process. And there was uh, one of the referee, for reasons which I would not agree completely, but I, you know, I could see where he was coming from, that was simply repeating at every round of refereeing that he would not publish his paper because uh, there was five standard deviation, 5.1 standard deviation for this photon. But then if I put in, and this is reasonable, right? If I have 5.1 standard deviation, you need five standard deviation for kind of a robust analysis in some sense. And, and there were other weaknesses, potential weaknesses. I think the analysis was strong enough uh, in, uh, to be very significant. Okay? Although uh, after this, I would like to see some others. But this alone is already very significant, a milestone. I would call it a milestone. I thought it was a very good publication in Nature. But, um, but there are all these concerns that one would like to see fade away with a few more observations of this type. Very good. With this, I think we have to thank the speaker again. Thank you.